This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Element. And the thing that we want to talk about today is dehydration. I know. We have taken dehydration and made it like a disease, like <laughs> hydrate or die. Well, as a matter of fact, I have a dear friend who just got a bunch of blood work back and had some kind of weird markers. And one of the theories of her physician um, based on her blood work was that she was super dehydrated. And I learned after talking to her that she was drinking something like 80 ounces of water a day. So plenty of actual water. Let me be clear. If you've ever done Edward 40 hands, that's about how much that is, right? It's a lot of water. And I, my theory is that she wasn't actually absorbing uh, any of the water she was drinking. Yeah, you know, we see this a lot. We've actually run into uh, athletes having this problem called hyponatremia, where they just blow out all their salts. And subsequently, if you start only drinking just mass amounts of water and you're not drinking it with eating with food and you're not supplementing with salts, then you are going to, I mean, this is just osmosis, right? <laughs> I mean, d d your body is going to put salts into that and you're going to lose salt. Yeah, and so she just started actually adding some element into her water every day and already notices a big difference in, in just in terms of like, honestly, how often she has to pee every single day that she already can just tell from that basic metric that yeah. she feels like she's absorbing more of the water If you're, if you're drinking tons drinking. and tons of water, look, we're not experts in this field, except if you're drinking tons of water and peeing all the time obsessively, that's a good indicator that you've topped that off and your brain, your body's no longer taking that water in. You're just hitting your kidneys and it's bouncing off. So if you want to increase your water because you're an athlete or you want to drink more, make sure you're just adding some salts to it. An element is the tastiest, tastiest it's salt there so is. so tasty, so yeah. tasty. I think uh, we're probably drinking enough water, but if we make sure that we're really hitting the water we're drinking, especially if you're drinking after exercise, not with food, Probably makes sense to have some electrolytes in there. And Element is the best, tastiest ones. Right now, if you order through our link, you get a free sample pack with all the Element flavors. Go to drinkelement.com slash TRS. We are excited to welcome Dr. Tommy Wood to the podcast today. Tommy is a neuroscientist, elite level professional and performance consultant to world-class athletes in a dozen sports. He received an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. Tommy is an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington and visiting scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. His research focuses on brain health and brain injury treatment across the lifespan, as well as developing easily accessible methods with which to track health, performance, and longevity in both professional athletes and the general population. Tommy serves as deputy editor of the Wiley Journal Lifestyle Medicine, is director of the British Society for Lifestyle Medicine, and consults for a number of digital health companies and charities that focus on how lifestyle and the environment can affect long-term health and chronic disease. I'll just say that obviously... Tommy is a slacker. Yeah, so lazy, <laughs> underachiever. Um, what's I? One of the things that I really love about this conversation is that even though Tommy is sometimes working in high performance, which is how we kind of became connected to him, he has the view and perspective as a physician through lifestyle aging, working from pediatrics all the way up, and he's got this other side of neuroscientists. So he's a physician, neuroscientist. I really feel like that gives him really unique perspective and not just talking about health, but talking about performance. Yeah, and you know, I think what I loved the most about this podcast was all of this sort of practical information we yeah. learned about brain health. You know, for those of us who are maybe no longer 25 and are starting to look forward in time in our lives and you know, make sure that not just the rest of our body, but our brain continues to be healthy as we age, I just thought his perspective and like actual practical tips on how we can think about how to maintain our brain health as we age was super valuable you mean just doing sudoku is not going to do it that's enough probably not going to quite be enough yeah and <laughs> i think right now we're having a moment where we're talking about longevity and here he is talking about how do we make your brain work appropriately so it can keep up with this body that's going to last 100 years yeah it's a, it we learned a ton and we're very excited and pumped up after this conversation so i think you're going to really enjoy it please enjoy our conversation with dr tommy wood Dr. Wood, welcome to the Ready State Podcast. And 
I, I'm just going to kick it right off and say that um, it's clear from your resume that you have been basically taking a nap for your entire life. So lazy. And you're so lazy. Um, no, in all seriousness, we're really excited to talk to you today about all things brain health. And uh, But before we do that, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, I know you're at University of Washington right now. Tell us a little bit about how you got into this field, sort of what drove you into it, and, and a little bit just generally about your background. Sure. Uh, first of all, super excited to be here. Uh, really nice to uh, hang out with you guys, and thanks so much for the for the invitation. Uh, you, you're right that essentially I was allergic to getting a real job, which meant that I spent all of my life <laughs> as a student, um, and then then recently did actually get some gainful employment as uh, an assistant professor of uh, pediatrics and neuroscience at the University of Washington, which is what I, uh, I do now. Um, the journey to get there um, obviously t- took a long time, um, but essentially started with um, an interest in biochemistry, so I did biochemistry as an undergrad. And back then, I was getting into being an athlete myself for the first time. I was uh, reading the CrossFit main site wad in 2003 when there were like eight people following it. Um, so oh my God, we, we were we were two of those other eight people. <laughs> and Rob Wolf, who is who is a, yes. a, a, a close friend. Um, and so then that kind of got me into some other aspects of, of health and performance and thinking about nutrition. Um, which then led me to, to medical school. Um, when I was at medical school, I, I, I spent some time uh, working in a, a basic uh, research lab looking at neonatal brain injury, and that's partly what I do now. So that was like right before and then a little bit during, during med school. And then I worked as a doctor for a couple of years and then went to Norway to do my PhD and was suddenly, rather than being, you know, sleep deprived and running around the hospital ward and the emergency department um, all night. I was back in front of a computer, uh, got the chance to look, look at PubMed, get back into some of my own interests. Uh, so started a blog, a podcast related to various aspects of health and performance. Um, I'd spent years uh, then as an athlete and, and a coach, particularly in, in rowing, that was my sport. And through that work, in parallel with my academic work, which is more sort of basic neuroscience in the lab with animal models of brain injury, helped uh, start up a company that worked with athletes to try and improve their health and performance. Um, and we basically, anything that we could get out of you, we analyzed uh, any fluid uh, that was available um, to look at nutrient status and gut health and all these other kinds of things. Um, and then those two streams have kind of continued in parallel. So I have my formal academic work, I do basic neuroscience, I try and find ways to treat brain injury uh, in babies, in people with traumatic brain injury and concussions. And I'm interested in how those, you know, you only get one brain. So how do those things interact over your entire lifespan to affect your late in life cognitive function, cognitive decline and dementia risk. And then I also still work uh, with athletes on various aspects of health and performance, particularly uh, in Formula One drivers, um, and in my mind, all these things kind of slot together in terms of how do you optimize the health and performance of an individual at any given stage of life and make sure that they can keep doing that for as long as possible. One of the unique features of your experience is that you have this classical education in biochem. You're a physician who is oftentimes on the other side of the lesion, other side of the injury, and then you know, you're also sort of in this performance model now and on this brain sort of health longevity, trying to look and get ahead of that. Mm-hmm. I always find that people with really diverse sort of perspectives end up bringing different sort of aspects, salient aspects of those seemingly disparate pieces back to the whole. Is that a feature that's useful? I mean, could you, do you feel like you could have this conversation without being a physician or have this conversation without have, being a PhD? I think that I'm trying to set my daughters up for like 16 uh, postgraduate degrees. That's what I do. <laughs> they should read uh, "Range" by David Epstein. Which, oh yeah, oh, right. they did. Oh. Okay, but, yeah. That, Georgia fact, wrote her college essay, and she's studying economics now because of David. So that that's kind of like my bible because it explains how I can have so many different disparate interests and 
hope for the, the whole is better than the sum of its parts. Um, and although I have, my wife has banned me from getting any further degrees. Uh, for now. For now. Just say, we say for now. <laughs> so I think that all those, all those different bits make, make a big difference. So there are examples where if I'm in the performance sphere, say, working with, working with athletes, I can, I can speak athlete. Uh, I can also speak coach. I can speak doctor in the in the uh, rare occasion that they need to go and see a specialist uh, about something. So every person who's part of that team, I have experience like speaking their language, and I think that helps because nutritionists have their own language, and coaches have their own language, and doctors have their own language. So that kind of allows me to connect across those things. But then it also has helped me, I guess, zoom out in in certain respects because. What's most interesting to me is when you when you look at each of those pockets. So neuroscience is very siloed, and every every aspect of medicine is very siloed, and often performance is is siloed. But the same core things are always important. Um, like sleep is always important, and nutrition is always important. Um, and then if we're thinking about cognitive function, how we use our brains is always important. And the details are di like different from scenario to scenario, but these same sort of core principles are important, regardless of whether you're just trying to raise healthy kids, or you're trying to you know, have an athlete perform at their peak for several years in a row, you can do, you can do a bad job of taking care of the basics and be just be a freak athlete. And this happens all the time and do well for one or two seasons but if you want to keep coming back for 10 years then then those things really matter could you say that again for the people in the back <laughs> please <laughs> especially all the all the parents who are listening who have children who they think are the next generation of freaks you're yeah. you got to do it the basics it's all about the basics so you know what i wanted to start with a little bit is as you're aware uh, longevity is having quite a moment mm -hmm. right now in our collective consciousness. And, and I'm hoping it's not just a moment because I think it's really an important shift in how we're thinking about medical care and mm -hmm. how we take care of our bodies. And I do think one of the, one of the best outcomes that's happening is that for many years, we've all sort of had this like long, slow rot theory of aging mm -hmm. that we've all, we adopted for many years. And I think that that perception is really starting to change, you know, not just amongst people like you who are doing deep research on this, but just collectively, um, in our general consciousness. And, and so, and I know brain health is a big part of that. So I, I guess my first question is, you know, what are the main determinants of, brain health or a healthy brain. And even how do you define that? I mean, maybe we yeah, should start that. What does that, 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 that mean? The way I've tried to um, explain what brain health is, and, and I'll say a lot of my work in this arena is, of course, done with others. So especially Dr. Josh Turkner, who's a neurologist and a close colleague of mine, and we've written, written and are writing papers together and have tried to sort of build some models around this stuff to help explain it. And... In its simplest form, I would say that brain health is having a brain that does the things that you want it to do when you want it to do them. And mm. that sounds kind of vague, but it also allows for the fact that what I want my brain to do isn't necessarily what you want your brain to do. And that's fine, right? That's perfectly that's perfectly okay. And this, you, you can also go down into conversations about like, what is intelligence? Because again, it matters like, what you want your brain to do. So standard intelligence tests are maybe useful for some things, but that's not necessarily a, a, a true expression of what the brain is capable of or what it, sh what it should be capable of. So does your brain do the things that you want it to do when you want it to do them uh, is a starting point. And then that also gives you a framework to think about, well, what should I do to help support my brain do those things? So the way that I think about it is in these buckets where the the primary driver of brain function is how you use your brain and i liken it to um, exercise or some kind of physical activity trying to train your body to be good at a physical act be that lifting weights in the gym or aerobic performance you need to provide the stimulus because the stimulus is what drives the later adaptation. And all the biochemical processes that happen in response to that are actually very similar in the brain as they are in, in muscle tissue. But after you've provided a stimulus, you need all the things to support that process. So say in the brain, as in the muscle tissue, you need a good 
uh, vascular supply, right? The blood vessels need to be healthy. They need to be able to supply oxygen, some kind of metabolic substrate, be that glucose, lactate, uh, ketones. Um, and so, and this is important because there's this idea of something called neurovascular coupling, which is a fancy way of saying that when one area of the brain is active, it pulls in more nutrients, but you need a healthy vascular system to, to respond to that uh, and for that to actually happen. And then you need these ongoing repair and adaptation processes to occur afterwards. So that requires certain nutrients to make sure that you can create new synapses and you know they're, they're functional. So that's where things like omega-3s and B vitamins become important. And you also need the absence of things that negatively affect that process. So smoking, large amounts of alcohol, air pollution, significant stress, like all of these things, you know, trauma to the brain, all these things can affect how, how good the brain is at adapting to a stimulus. And then you need to provide the time for that adaptation to occur, which is sleep, which is sleep essentially. So some period of, of, of rest. Then with that kind of model, that allows you to then think, well, if I'm having some issue, is it that I haven't provided the necessary stimulus? Or is it that I'm not uh, providing the time to adapt to that stimulus? Or is it that I'm doing something with my lifestyle or environment that's inhibiting that process? So I think about it that way. So then you can, can think about where is what's the lowest hanging fruit? What's the best place for me to act in terms of enhancing my own cognitive performance? So you're saying that if I have a sauna, that may not just solve all the problems. <laughs> well, it might help. It, it, it ticks a lot of boxes, sauna, right? Because <laughs> it improves uh, improves vascular health. Um, it uh, helps with detoxification, right? Sweat is an important detoxi detoxification mechanism. So it's not a panacea, but could be helpful. <laughs> So I uh, just to follow up on that same question, I've I've also read in your work that there are some age related determinants to brain health. Um, you know, I think there's obviously some. What I understand is there's some similarities in brain health across all age groups, and then there are some age age related factors for young, middle age, and older people. There's, Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, I think there's two two main parts. To that, that I think you're asking about, although maybe you're asking about something else. But one is how uh, how we use our brains and how our brains function changes over time. Yeah, I love this. I was going to really just drill. I just heard you talk about this. So one thing that, that tends to happen <clears throat> is people say, you know, my brain just doesn't work like it used to. I don't remember things like I used to. And part of it, I think, is completely normal. Because if we use the example of like a, a library or a hard drive, and that's not quite how the brain works, and that's for a different type of neuroscientist to discuss with maybe philosophers in terms of how the brain actually works in terms of storing memories. But imagine you have a hard drive or a library of books, and you're frustrated because you can't remember where you put your keys. Now, if every time you put your keys down somewhere, that's a new book, on your shelf of places I've put my keys. There's just a lot more books to search through. Um, and you may actually get to a point where the brain is like, well, I don't need to add more books to this because it's actually not, it's not that important. We remember things that are novel and that we show our brains are important, like salient details. That's what, that's what really drives um, creating memories. And you know that in the big, like, grand scheme of things, remembering exactly where your keys are every time is like that's like a small fry. Whereas, if you generate a memory or or something happens that generates some kind of stress and intense focus, that's what really drives creating memories. But that doesn't happen when you just like throw your keys down. So part of it is you know, maybe you haven't told your brain that this is an important memory to create, so it just doesn't bother, right? It's continuously filtering out useless information because there's just no way that you can remember all of it. So that's part of it. Um, and then um, the, 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 other part, the other part of it is, um, I can't remember what I was going to say, um, which is not good. Um, so, <laughs> well, you were talking, yeah, well, you were talking about age related, but I mean, I think that makes exact sense that it, you know, I, I love the, I mean, I, I realize it may be slightly oversimplified for the, you know, hardcore neuroscientists in the world, but I love the hard drive idea. In fact, I was just talking to our friend, Erin Kafaro, who's in the middle of getting her PhD right now in psychology and talking about turning 50 this year. 
and and actually feeling like exactly what you're saying is that often my brain is actually overloaded and not that I'm having any cognitive decline, but that, you know, there's, there's parts of my brain that are full up and sometimes it's hard to add new information. Let, so. let me, let me ask you, this as a feature of what you just <laughs> said. Do you think sometimes that these behaviors or the perceived change in cognition is that we stop flexing the brain that we get I think I've heard you say we start practicing. We're really good. We stop being in these learning rich environments. We just live in like a habit state. Yeah, and that, and then suddenly you're also sort of like I'm 50, and maybe I don't go outside, or maybe I'm not learning new skills, or I'm not engaging in new environments or traveling, or taking risk. Yeah, and so that my brain suddenly starts to sort of pare down its capacities because it's it's really expensive to keep those things online. Am I, am I right in thinking that way too, that it may be chicken and egg? Yeah, a- absolutely. So, so one part of it, um, there are, I guess there are three main parts. One part is this, maybe this transition from knowledge to wisdom, right? Your, your brain becomes better at identifying things that are worth remembering versus things that aren't. And unless you specifically tell it different, you know, that's where some of these changes in, in um, memory formation or memory retrieval come from. Another part of it is, as we as we get older, we may pay less attention to the things that support some of these processes. So when you think about a memory, there are two broad things that happen. One is that memory has to be encoded. And then the other one is that memory has to be retrieved, right? You have to write the book and then it, and put it on the shelf, and then you have to remove it from the shelf and, and know where that is. In the majority of people who are having issues with remembering you know the different aspects of recall to say remembering where the keys are some of it may be this just filtering out of information over time and another part of it may just be that do you know what actually you're sleep deprived and stressed and (laughs) and and that's those are the things that tend to uh, affect memory retrieval when you're thinking about a pathological decline in cognitive function, that's often a problem with memory encoding. You never make that memory in the first place. And that's what we see with Mm. significant dementia. That's why um, when we try and treat people with Alzheimer's, one of the drugs is cholinesterase inhibitors. They use cholinesterase inhibitors because that increases the amount of acetylcholine that's around in the synapse. And that's what's critical for memory encoding. And other things can be like other nutritional factors and stuff can be important there as well. But it's just worth remembering that for most people, the issue is with memory retrieval, not with memory encoding. And that's perfectly normal in somebody who has done that same thing hundreds of times over 50 years and is maybe a little bit sleep deprived, a little bit stressed. And so that's where I would, that's what I would pay attention to those things and they will improve memory retrieval. The, the third part is how we use our brains over time. So this is exactly what Kelly's saying. When we talk to ourselves about our brains, we're like, well, I'm just getting older. My brain just doesn't work as it used to. And that's just a normal part of aging. Um, And on average, that is absolutely true. If you look at trajectories of cognitive function across the lifespan, they increase with increasing age, like after you're born, and they probably peak sometime around the end of your formal education, whenever that is end of high school, you know, undergrad, grad school. Because during that entire period of time, what you're doing is continuously stimulating the brain. You're providing that ongoing stimulus and it's it's like progressive overload, right? It gets harder and harder and harder over time. And with that, you, you build up, you build up cognitive, you build up cognitive function because of that stimulus. When you then leave formal education, what you tend to do is specialize and do the same thing again and again and again and again. (laughs) And it's no longer a significant or novel stimulus. Um, And that's probably a good thing, right? If you're a surgeon, I don't want you thinking about every single movement your finger makes. I want them to be automatic, right? Absolutely. But in terms of the stimulus it's providing the brain, it's just not at the same level as when they learn those skills in the first place. So when you track how we use our brains across our lives, that parallels how our brains function across our lives. And then the next, so as we specialize more and more and more, and we do the same thing every day, our cognitive function declines because we're no longer stimulating, you know, generating new skills, creating these new novel stimuli for the brain. And then there's an even sharper drop off when we retire because the stimulus we were getting from our work, and that includes 
social interaction as well as whatever uh, stimulus comes from the work that we do, that drops off. And that's actually when the, the period of cognitive decline is steepest is right after retirement. So the argument um, that I would make, and this is the argument that uh, uh, Josh and I made in, our, in a paper that we wrote recently, was that it's not that as we get older, our, our cognitive function declines just because we're getting older. It's that we're using our brains less. And as a result, mm. that's decreasing our cognitive function. Just like if you stop going to the gym, you're going to lose conditioning. You're going to get less strong. And when people then say, well, I'm not going to do this thing because my brain doesn't work as well as I used to. It's like saying, well, I'm getting weaker, so I'm, not, I'm going to stop going to the gym. And it's stopping going to the gym that's the problem, not the 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 actual you know, the fact that you are going to lose some function over time, that's expected. We can't prevent aging completely. But the worst thing that you can do is then just say, well, I just can't do this anymore because my because I'm old. Um, and that's what a lot of people tend to do. And that then accelerates the decline. That's amazing. So, so I'm wondering if there's certain types of intellectual stimuli that are better than others, because I, obviously we're going to talk a lot about physical uh, stimulus here in a minute. But, you know, I think the first time I ever became aware of anything related to brain health was probably 20 years ago when people said, well, when you get older, you should try to learn a new language because that's going to help stimulate your brain and keep your brain active and, and you know, your cognition good for as long as you live. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I wonder if things like that really, is that a myth or is that true? And then I'm also wondering, are there things that are actually you know, negative to the stimulus? Like, is this, you know, constant focus scrolling we're all doing on social media? Is that, is that actually a negative intellectual stimulus for our brain? Um, you, you know, I don't know if you could talk about both those things. That'd be great. Uh, learning a language, I think is, is one of the best stimu uh, sort of novel stimuli that you can, that you can create. And there are, there's some, um, there's some nice data on people who either grew up bilingual or who learn a language later in life. It improves their overall cognitive function as well as some aspects of brain structure, like you can measure it on an MRI. Um, music is another way to do that, lear learning an instrument. Um, one of my favorite papers looked at uh, the brain age of musicians versus non-musicians. And, and brain age is this machine learning algorithm that's been trained on thousands of MRIs. And it says, this is the MRI. This is how old this person is. And then you can feed it a new MRI and say, how old does this brain look? And what they found, they looked, they looked at individuals, they were relatively young, they were in their 20s and 30s. But musicians had younger looking brains compared to non-musicians. But amateur musicians had an even greater benefit than professionals. And the hypothesis was that for an amateur, it's harder. Because if you're a professional, you're already so good at this, it's no longer the same stimulus. So being an amateur and working hard at something you're not good at seems to be particularly good for the brain. So music, language, um, and then a whole bunch of physical activities, dancing um, is seems to be one of the best. Um, and often these uh, stimuli come with, or these skills come with a social component, right? It requires another person to interact with mm -hmm. in order to do that. And that's the case for languages. It's usually the case for, case for music. It's the case for uh, physical activities like dancing. And that's where maybe some of the magic comes from as well. Well, people at the Ready State are going to be very glad to hear that because Lisa, our producer's husband, is a professional musician <laughs> and we have lots of musicians in the house. So shout out Mike um, Luthier. Yeah, shout out to uh, Mike Sloat. Let me ask you, um, I think is something that always resonates with me is that some of my earliest super coaching experiences, my mentors, um, I found that they were particularly excellent coaches because they could coach across so many platforms. They could work with children and then they could the same afternoon work with an Olympic athlete. And that diversity and range, I just appreciated because it really is pretty extraordinary that you're in there working with children. And then you're in the afternoon, you're like, Oh, F1, you know, formula one. <laughs> but besides the capacities of range, it, it definitely highlights sort of, for me as a coach, what is essential in terms of what is sequential in the learning or the skill that I'm going to do. And what's a, if I'm teaching this person, I ultimately want them to be Olympian. It really influences the way, the things that I believe by way of saying now here you are working with 
Formula One drivers sort of I think of as the the highest some of the highest intellectual highest speed reaction function processing speeds, and you're working at the same time teaching pediatrics and neurobiology there. What can you have? Has that led you to be able to see these are seemingly like excellent behaviors that allow us to continue to run and develop and nurture cognitive development in the human over a lifespan? Yeah, I think so. And it often comes back to those to those same basics. Like those are the things that pop up again and again and again, like sleep is, and it it's not anything new, right? Maybe this is just a new way of thinking about it, but like sleep is non-negotiable, as is progressive, um, some idea of progressive skill development or progress, you know, progressive overload, if you want to uh, compare it back to exercise. And when you're looking at, say, developing the brain in the first place, and actually, for myself as a coach, this is something that, that I've experienced and I can reflect back on, that allowing for failure as a learning tool is critically important. And so that we see this a lot, particularly in brain development, so in kids, is, is giving them an environment where they're allowed to fail and try again and fail and, and get better over time. And that could be with like feeding themselves versus some kind of physical movement or, or something else. And it's one of the reasons why I think I ended up being a reasonably good rowing coach is because I was so bad that I, I failed so much and I was physically gifted, but not technically gifted as a rower like i could sit on a rowing machine and just like pound it out but try and get me to like coordinate an oar or something like that. i was terrible at it so a lot of people put a lot of effort into teaching me how to not be as bad um but that process of failure and it's the same with you know i, I go 10 years ago i thought low carb was the the solution to everything and then when you when that fails with dozens of people for whatever reason in front of you Right then, you know you have to expand your toolkit. So that I think that's one thing that that really goes across all those areas of discipline is that allowing for for failure as a learning tool, and that I think is also really good, really good for the brain as well as our own, you know, individual broader f- philosophical development. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. Look, one of the places when people start asking, "What can I do for my health? Should I take some supplements?" I'm supplement curious. We recommend just starting with a rock solid multivitamin. Yeah, and the Momentous multivitamin is a super jam packed whole food based multivitamin that really can sort of fill in the gaps that you may be yeah you may minerals. be missing by getting you know in certain foods you're eating. Yeah, you know I I think one of the the things is we would love to like fantasize about everyone getting six to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day across a wide variety of rainbows and nutrient, like it's just not possible. And I think one of the things that we should be thinking about, yes, food is always first, but there are small minerals and micronutrients that you may not be getting in your diet, especially if you're like eating that sashimi chicken breast with brown rice, that is an incomplete (laughs) non-nutrient dense food. Yeah, or if you, you know, have certain preferences that just means you don't eat a super diverse amount of fruits and vegetables, you just may be missing some of those. Are you picking on me for my love just only rutabaga? I mean, you do like rutabaga, let's be honest. (laughs) All the rutabaga. Yeah, and I, I think the way we think about this is this is a way to fill in the gaps and the perfect place to start if you're sort of supplement curious. Also, it's something that we give to our teenage daughter who yeah. we know for sure has gaps in Whatever. her nutrition. Gaps in her nutrition. <laughs> that kid is covering every brown food there is. So look, the idea here is first steps first. Let's make sure that you're getting all the micronutrients that your body needs that are so you're not rate limited by those things. And then you can sort of, Go yeah, branch out from there, yeah, but yeah, yeah start with the start basics. Start with a solid multivitamin. Yeah, Momentous multivitamin is it. Go to livemomentous.com slash TRS and use code TRS for 20% off your first purchase. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Yeti. And what we want to talk to you about today is our latest obsession, and that is with the six and eight ounce stackable mugs. Dude, dude, it's, it's the thing that's been missing from my life. Imagine... The perfect size coffee cup for your espresso, for your Americano. It's for your cappuccino. No one, I, I get more 
sort of positive attention, positive regard, when I whip out my little Here. my little mini six or eight ounce coffee cup, this thing is so dope. Um, you and I started traveling with it. We got them early, and it's the perfect coffee cup. Sometimes, do you remember that time we were in New York, and I like brought in my like classic Yeti mug down, and it just confused the crap out of everyone. <laughs> They didn't know what to do. The, the, the hipster was like, you know, twirling her mustache and her like, uh, you know, leather apron. And she was like, I don't know what to do with this. If I had pulled this cup out, she would have been like, oh, espresso goes in that. Yeah. And a couple amazing things about these little cups. I mean, not only are they adorable to look at, which mm. is important. They fit over underneath um, almost every espresso machine. Definitely yeah. ours. Uh, they're stackable. And then, as Kelly said, they're so great to travel with because sometimes you don't want to be traveling with a big, huge, heavy mug, but they just pop right yeah, into the yeah. bottom of your backpack and are easy to get. It fits in the outside pocket. And, and also, same thing for you know doing outdoor adventures. You know, sometimes like the little things are what matters when you're outside and sleeping outside, and having having a really lovely insulated mug is one of those things that can really matter and make you know camping back packing being outside like just all the nicer and I, this mug is perfect yeah for that. the stackable cup is the is 100 percent my favorite thing right now yeah we're obsessed with them if you want to find out and create your own obsession go to the readystate.com slash stackable cups so you've been working on some papers recently with uh some other researchers that we know well including dr galpin and it's become obvious from your work that physical strength in in the general prop, uh, population is a direct predictor of cognitive function, particularly leg strength. Could you tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing around that and what that? And means? does that just mean like steroids and BFR for everyone for brain health, or is there <laughs> is there is there more nuance than that? One hundred percent. That's you've that, you've literally cracked you've cracked the code. Um, <laughs> We so we recently looked at uh, some data from the from the US NHANES cohort, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is, if people don't know, it's it's this yearly um, st yearly study where they they grab a cohort of adults and children who are supposed to represent sort of the average US population, and they do a whole bunch of tests, uh, blood tests, questionnaires, physical examinations, and from year to year, it kind of differs in terms of what they look at. Some, like, sometimes they look at cognitive function. Sometimes they're looking for specific contaminants in particular. So they might look at certain heavy metals or other things that they're kind of concerned about in the general population. Um, but we looked at a few um, phases of NHANES where they had older adults, so they're in their 60s. Uh, they have a, a DEXA scan, so we know something about their body composition. They did a, a cognitive function test called the digit symbol substitution test, which is kind of a test of uh, general processing speed. Um, and then they also had their physical activity or their f physical performance measure was isometric leg strength. And I liked leg strength because often people just do grip strength. And grip strength is fine, but I think you have a better idea of somebody's overall physical function if you can measure their, their quad strength, which is what they did. And essentially what we wanted to look at was how lots of different factors interact and then affect cognitive function. Because usually what happens when you have a study is you you have like one thing that you're interested in and you have one outcome, say it's cognitive function, and say your, your predictor is leg strength. And you have all these other things that you kind of throw into a statistical model and you adjust for them, but you never see how all those factors interact. So one thing that I like to do is show how all these factors interact with more complex models, but you can kind of see this is how all these things are related to one another. And so we did that with le levels of physical activity, physical strength, uh, some blood tests that we know are related to cognitive uh, function, so um, like B, B vitamin status, vitamin D, things like that, um, and you know, age and sex and that kind of stuff is important as well. And we essentially saw that muscle mass is not a great predictor of cognitive function, um, which which kind of went against uh, what some other studies had shown. And a much better predictor was muscle function, which was essentially how strong are your legs. And we 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 made it so like how strong are your legs relative to your body size to kind of make it fair. And that seemed to be our our best uh, physical predictor. And so the hypothesis is that how strong you are is some idea of overall neuro, neuromuscular function, right? You have the muscle, but then you have the brain and the whole nervous system to coordinate it. And 
there are also studies that show if you train people, particularly with resistance training, um, you can improve obviously strength, but you also improve cognitive function and you can see those changes uh, in the brain. And that's more so than aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise does seem to improve some aspects of brain structure, but doesn't always necessarily affect uh, brain function, whereas resistance training and then co coordination-based exercise seem to be better for cognitive function. Um, the, do you think, uh, the final interesting thing- Do you think that's thing, a function? Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say the final interesting thing to me was that in the general population, physical activity and muscle mass were not correlated. And that's probably why uh, muscle mass was not a good predictor of, of cognitive function. So in general, in the average population, you gain muscle mass as part of gaining total mass, but that mass is not functional. You haven't built it through yeah. the process of, say, resistance training or something like that. Um, and this is important because there are some other studies that say high muscle mass is associated with higher heart disease risk or higher mortality risk, particularly in men. But I think that's because that mu that's not muscle that you gained doing squats and bicep mm -hmm. curls in the gym. That's muscle that you gain just by being bigger overall, and that's not the same thing. So that was the other important takeaway, is that how you get your muscle is also probably going to be important as it relates to your overall health and function. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> and something I learned in physio school kind of blew my mind was this professor put up a, this, this model of monkeys where they had the monkey reach for the banana, the piece of fruit, and it lit up a certain pathway in the brain. And then they moved the chip over and the, the, the banana, the monkey reached for the, the chip in a different place. You know, and it was a different pathway in the brain. The brain lit up differently. And when she was, and this is in my neurobio class, but one of the things that she was taking away was she's saying, hey, the, your brain is wired for movement. It's not wired for muscles. It doesn't think biceps and coordination. And do you think that's the, one of the salient features here is that, that your brain doesn't necessarily, and, and I may be wrong here, discriminate between a physical behavior and a, a cognitive behavior, that learning is learning, whether I'm thinking about learning a new skill of language or learning it maybe it's, it's the learning piece that is the sort of really salient feature here there's definitely some task specificity in terms of how the brain adapts to to learning and you will divert uh you will divert resources to regions of the brain that are associated with a, a certain task so as an example uh, another one of my favorite studies uh, was done with uh, taxi drivers in London. And mm. back in the day, the black cabs in London, you had to you had to to be a black cab driver and be a taxi driver in central London. You had to pass a test called the knowledge. The knowledge <laughs> is memorizing twenty five thousand streets in a six mile radius around Charing Cross Station in downtown central London, and you so you had to be able to navigate the, the entire of central London without a map. And they looked at uh, the brains of people before and after they studied for this test, and those who, and then they had a control group as well. Those who passed the test had a significant increase in the, the density of the gray matter in the hippocampus, which is uh, associated with memory. Um, and it's also directly affected in, in dementia. It's one of the regions of the brain that's affected in dementia. And those who didn't, who failed to pass the test, didn't have this change in the brain. The control group didn't either. But what they also found was that those people who'd successfully passed the test, and this is years of study, and they've invested huge resources in this part of the brain to memorize this map of London, they then actually performed less well in other cognitive tasks because they've essentially poured so many resources into one area. So one part of it is that there is probably this like generalized skill learning procedure that's beneficial, but there is also specificity. And if you ask your brain to just be really, really good at one thing, it's probably going to be less good at other things. Just the same as, you know, if you want to be a competitive powerlifter, you're not also going to be a championship level marathon runner. Um, and the brain seems to be the same. So this question I have may be a little bit apart from brain health. And if it is, I apologize. But one of the things that I've become more aware of in, um, you know, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons talked about this and some others recently sort of in my, in my, in my universe is that strength and strength is really connected to survivability 
from disease, which is particularly interesting to me as a cancer survivor myself, um, gives me the perspective that, you know, there, I believe there are a thousand and one things we can all do to take care of our health. And then there's also chances that we can get disease regardless of what we do. Um, and certain cancers certainly fall into that category. So, um, so the survivability piece I think is pretty important and uh, knowing that, there's a percentage of us that are going to get, you know, hit with some kinds of diseases in our lives. Ab absolutely. And when I give, when I give talks about say muscle mass and health, which I do a lot because I'm, I'm passionate about that. Um, I like bicep curls. Um, <laughs> so say we all, Oh my God, you're speaking Kelly's <laughs> language. <right now. laughs> a lot, a lot of people will then turn around to me and say, well, do you know, do you know what you have a body type or you have muscle mass that's not consistent with our evolutionary history, right? You go and look at hunter gatherer tribes there, they're, they're less muscular or they don't, they don't look physically, they're obviously lean and they're, and they're very strong and fit, but they don't look overtly muscular. And my response to that is that we know that muscle mass is a buffer and it's a buffer against disease It's a buffer against sleep deprivation because of you know glucose handling and the whole all the things that get released from muscle tissue when we exercise that are beneficial for the brain and body um we know that it's a buffer against the modern food environment because again of glucose disposal and other things so if we're in an environment that even with our um you know our best intentions and we work really hard to keep ourselves as healthy as possible disease is still inevitable at some point working as hard as you can to create these buffers i think is really important and muscle is one of our most important buffers against everything that modern life throws at us for all the for all the reasons that that you've described so that's why i think it's, it's critically important and we can talk about all the different reasons why that may be um but you know if i could get people to do anything like learn a new skill and you know do a few squats i think that's it's not going to prevent disease necessarily entirely but Having that buffer when you get there, I think is really important. Yeah, I think it's important to think both about prevention and survivability. Yeah. I mean, those are those two yeah, things. Yeah, we are love important. the word durability yeah. because we think the hits are coming. Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead and have a baby and let me know how it goes for you. <laughs> uh, I just want to say I'm already going to take away because I always use bicep curls, like they're really important <laughs> for, but I, but I use them for elbow health. Because I'm like, we need to make those, you know, we're going to store rotation. <laughs> but now I'm going to start calling bicep curls brain health. Yeah. And uh, I just feel like I've just won any argument for anyone I ever I, again. I was initially resistant to bicep curls, but now I'm on board. Brain health. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think has changed in the last 10 years, and certainly I've started to become very aware of this as a young student in the last, you know, almost 20 years ago. I did a lot of my um, education at the World Center for PNF at Kaiser Vallejo, where we saw a lot of people with new head trauma, new you know cerebrovascular accidents. And it was really remarkable to see how after injury, a brain could regain function. And functionality is, it's interesting that you use the word when you describe brain health, being able to access your brain, do the things you want. It's, it's actually mirrors exactly our definition of mobility. Can you express the range of motion that you want to do for your, you know, to be in your society, in your, in your family, in your community. But seeing these recovering of this and then reading later on about, hey, it turns out that the brain really can continue to heal itself. And I think it was, I think the, the brain that heals itself, maybe that was Doage the first time I read that. And just understanding that there were these essential behaviors, as you say, these keystones of walking, of walking quickly, of sleep, of, that, of, of good nutrition, that really set the case for the brain to be able to heal itself. Are you continuing to see that, especially in modes of concussion and the head trauma and some of these other aspects that you're you're featuring because i, I want to eventually start swinging also into your high performance work because i think it working in those fields helps us understand backwards of what's happening yeah absolutely uh, i think the examples that you give uh, are very similar to to what we've seen and, and you know you you uh you read the news and you follow some uh, people as they recover from you know very significant brain trauma the 
the main message that you can take away from that, I think, and it, it's, it, it's another one that kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier, is that the brain is not this thing that like is really good for the first 20 years and then just inexorably, inevitably gets worse <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it, right? The brain is this incredibly adaptable and plastic, like plastic is the word, um, this plastic organ that can still respond to stimuli and rewire itself as it needs to and as it's directed to, as long as you provide the right environment, essentially all the way through life until maybe you get to you know later stage dementia. All right, you can still learn new languages late in life. You can still learn new skills at any time. You can still improve cognitive function even in your 70s and 80s uh, by providing the necessary stimuli, um, just like the brain is capable of amazing um, adaptation in the face of significant trauma. And that may be repurposing different areas of the brain for, for certain tasks that weren't uh, originally used for that or, you know, and or you know, repairing significant damage. And you know, th there's, there's always going to be a point where you, you can't overcome everything. But it, as you look at the way people adapt after injury, that's one of the best ways that I think you can show how adaptable the brain is and pl how plastic it is regardless of, of where you are in your lifespan. Amazing. So I think I probably have some ideas of how you'll answer this question, but to the extent that, you know, we have mostly a layperson audience listening to the Ready State podcast, what are your recommendations to people to both have brain health and also avoid any, you know, as much as they can, any age-related cognitive decline and what are you doing? Sort of what are your greatest hits um, that you are doing on a daily basis for your own brain health? Very, uh, a, a great question and very important. And again, goes back to that same, I guess that, that model that I was talking about earlier. So at, d depending on who you ask, they're going to have a different, they're going to prioritize things differently. Like I work with a lot of individuals um, you know, in the kind of dementia arena who are like, the number one most important thing is nutrient status, right? So in particular, B vitamin status and omega-3 status are very important. Um, and that's been shown now in multiple randomized controlled trials, as is iron status, vitamin D, things like that. Others will say the most important thing is avoiding metabolic disease, right? Avoid prediabetes, avoid metabolic syndrome, <laughs> um, avoid, you know, pathological changes in body composition, right? Ensure, you know, adequate muscle mass and, and be physically active. Um, I personally think that the most important thing is providing novel stimuli to the brain, like keep using your brain, uh, particularly in spheres that you want it to be, to be good at. And then those other things are, are, are important uh, to, to support it. But those would, be, those would be my main things. So some kind of continued skill development, right? Frequently do something that you're bad at and slowly get better at it. And then when you're really good at it, do something else that you're bad at and get better at that. Then ensuring adequate nutrient status. So I would recommend that people um, do a basic blood test, check your homocysteine level, vitamin D level, iron level, uh, omega-3 status, that, you know, uh, metabolic health, uh, get a uh, fasting blood sugar and insulin and uh, look at some basic lipids, your HbA1c, that kind of stuff. So again, basics that, that most doc most doctors should do for you. Um, and then f you know, phys physical activity, critically important. So both muscle mass and then aerobic fitness, right? We talked about the importance of vascular health for brain health. So what's good for the heart is also good for the brain. A lot of people have said that and that, that seems to be true. And then... I've actually never heard that before. Have you not? Mm -hmm. No. Well, yeah. So in general, anything that's good for the heart is also good for the brain. And so that's like physical activity and nutrition and those kinds of things as well. Um, and then sleep and some kind of stress um, mitigation or distress tolerance, however you like to think about it. Durability is a nice way to think about it, like being able to tolerate stress because we can't avoid it uh, entirely. And then don't drink too much. Don't smoke. Um, yeah, that's it. You know what I was, uh, when you were saying, um, about, you know, making sure you're learning novel things, I think that is, um, just to give a little plug to CrossFit for a second. I think that's one of the reasons why Kelly and I fell in love with it in the first place and then have continued to practice it for all these years. We were terrible at Be everything. <laughs> yeah. Because when we started CrossFit, you know, I also, by the way, I don't know if you know, but I was a rower in high school yeah. and college as well. So we can chat about that later, but, um, but you know, man, I mean, you wrote I, in the cut. I was just. 
I had one athletic skill and that was suffering. And when I discovered CrossFit, I was like, oh, wow, okay, I'm, I have no skills. And, you know, to this day, there are 50 CrossFit skills that I'm bad at and that I still try to touch every so often on the regular. And so, you know, I, I, as you were talking about that sort of novel physical stimulus and learning new things, I was like, well, I'm, I'm feel lucky that we found this practice that involves so many skills that we are bad at. <laughs> and one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but which CrossFit I think is a great example of, it's one of my favorite examples of, is community and social interaction. Yes. Um, ah. And that's critically yeah. important for long-term brain health. I haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, except for I, I said that some of the activities, some of the skills have a social component and that's really important. But that's one, another aspect of CrossFit that I think is great is the community and social interaction that, that comes with it, which is also like super important for long-term brain health. We saw in the pandemic, so a lot of social isolation, social isolation. And uh, we, I don't remember who, where I saw, saw it, Rutherford or someone else, a geneticist talking about it, saying a brain is only a brain if it's around other brains. Mm -hmm. And I, that really, I'd heard that before, but then seeing sort of the rates of depression, sort of the, the decrease in function, whatever that looked like, and the way that people tried to self-soothe through alcohol and, you know, gaining weight and eating, all of those things, TV, really highlighted this point that, you know, that this community function is, I mean, how much of our brain is wired towards interacting with other people and surviving with other people. And I... I would love you to just talk a little bit more about what you've discovered in terms of, you know, social interaction as a piece of brain health. Cause you just talked about it, but mm -hmm. we have seen it firsthand that it just destroyed. Yeah, we ran people. a, we ran an experiment and it didn't go well. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> so that reminds me, I, I never answer, answered your question about scrolling it in social media. And oh, yeah, I okay, think perfect. Um, we can maybe touch on that first. I, I think that when, we are often, often we're 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 wired to 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 assume that all of these things are bad, um, and there is a potential benefit to that mind mindless scrolling, which is what it is. Is often um, it's almost meditative. I'm not saying is is as good as meditation, um, but it's just like Sudoku and crosswords. We think of them as cognitive stimulus. They're not. They don't stimulate the brain, but they do create this kind of sort of meditative. They're more like a mindfulness. Um, a practice than they are a cognitive stimulus. So, wait, are you saying that my doom scrolling is like like junk alpha state? Just something like. Are you saying that is, that, that? is that what I'm hearing now? Is that why? Is that why I do the wordle and then fall immediately asleep? Uh, yeah, actually, I do that. Well, I always do the wordle first thing in the morning with my coffee. So then I'm 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 stimulating at the same time. But so, so these things aren't necessarily bad, but they so it could provide this kind of almost mindless state if if that's how people access it there are probably better ways to access it but you know it's it's an option <laughs> however where it is potentially detrimental almost or almost certainly detrimental then feeds into the the social connection piece which is related to social interaction and social status and how they affect uh, our overall health so a colleague of mine dr julian abel um and i we just actually edited a special edition of, a, of a, an academic journal called Lifestyle Medicine. And the, the um, edition was about community and social interaction on health. And one of the papers in there kind of outlines, you know, line, outlines this really nicely, like how social isolation and social stresses affect our health. And this is by George Slavich and his colleagues at UCLA. And they've essentially detailed how the way that we see ourselves relative to others. So are we isolated? Do we feel supported? Do we feel like we have a low social rank? And that's where social media becomes a problem, right? You're seeing other people who are better than you, happier than you, fitter than you. More jacked and more tanned. More jacked and yep. tan than you. And that has a negative effect on your your mm. personal view of where you where you lie in society. And actually how you feel is what matters rather than the truth. So if you look at, people based on their socioeconomic status, which we know is an important social determinant of health for a whole bunch of reasons. If you, uh, like how you are rated, like objectively based on income, education level, that kind of stuff is much less important than how you feel you, are, how you rank compared to the rest of society. And how that affects your physiology is that when you are isolated or stressed or you feel, um, 
essentially like you have a lower social rank, be that based on whatever, education, uh, income, jackedness. Um, this creates um, a physiologic response that is essentially a, a chronic stress response. So it changes our immune systems as well as it inc increases um, sympathetic nervous activation and cortisol release. And evolutionarily, this makes sense. Because when we're socially isolated, we no longer have people to look after us. So we upregulate these same processes, but they are associated with things like improved wound healing, right? So if you fall and cut yourself, you will heal that wound faster. That's how you've, you've shifted your immune system to do that. That's, that's what happens when you upregulate these sort of stress responses. But you also downregulate other aspects of your immune system. So you are less good at dealing with uh, a virus say, because um, communicable viruses only come when you're surrounded by other people. So you <laughs> at, you can see the shift in the immune system, and you can measure it. So it's evolutionary advantageous if you're isolated to, ha to activate these stress responses, because you, you are short term more likely to survive if you're out in the jungle or whatever. But long term, those things then negatively start to affect cardiovascular disease risk, um, anxiety and depression, other aspects of cognitive function. So there's this direct connection between our how socially supported um, and socially accepted we feel t through our physiology related to stress and inflammatory responses to long-term disease risk. So that's how your social connection to others and, and how you see yourselves in, in relation to others, and that's where social media is potentially problematic, can directly affect your long-term mental and physical health. Well, and that makes sense to me just in the context of the ongoing conversation about teen mental health in particular as it relates to social media and, of course, suggests that it may not be the social media in and of itself, but all of those other things that you mentioned earlier, which are the so social isolation and how we see ourselves compared to others and those kinds of factors that are you know, not necessarily the social media itself. And there's also now a fairly well described bi-directional relationship so if you already have um some kind of mental health disorder you're more drawn to use social media so social media negatively affects mental health and then once your mental health is affected or if it's affected by something else you may be more drawn into isolating and then you know interacting through social media rather than, than in person so it does go both ways so I know Kelly wants to ask some questions about the high performance side, and I'm going to turn it over to him, but I, I'm hoping to get in one more just general question. Um, I think I read that something like two thirds of dementia cases are in women post menopausal women. I don't know if I have that correct. Yep. Um, but uh, I know that there is a role of in hormones uh, in, in that, or at least you know, that's the theory and potentially a, you know, more outsized role of hormone replacement therapy, therapy for women, especially because of some changes in thinking on, you know, that study that came out years ago. So I'd love it if you could just sort of talk about, you know, where we are in terms of women in particular, postmenopausal women, hormone replacement therapy, and then we can talk about the sexy stuff, which is asking, formula one. Asking for a friend. <laughs> asking for a friend. So the... There is some early and, and quite compelling work done by people like Lisa Moscone, which show that hormonal status in women at, around, and just after the menopausal transition are associated with dementia or cognitive decline risk. Um, estrogen is also a trophic factor for the brain. We know it directly supports uh, neurons in the brain, so we, so it's so it's an important just for support for supporting overall brain health and function. We're not at a point where you can say hormone replacement therapy decreases the risk of dementia. Um, people have looked at that. And hormone replacement therapy uh, studies are always super tricky because it, when they've done the randomized controlled trials, they probably used you know terrible versions of the hormones that they were replacing. And then more recently, it's like this mixed bag of observational studies where you kind of look at women who took different things in different combinations, given to them at different times. Like, how do you then unpick what's what's uh, re truly going to be able to affect later cognitive function? So I think we can say that we know hormones are important. If the menopausal transition comes with significant symptoms, whatever they are, um, 
and they are ameliorated with hormone replacement therapy and start, that started early, I think it's very likely to be net beneficial. Um, even if that means that because the the HRT is in it, you, you feel physically better or you feel cognitively better, which then means that you're able to continue physical activities, continual social activities, continue to do the things you want to do. Uh, so there may even be indirect benefits, but there's no large randomized controlled trial that I can, where I can point and say HRT will prevent dementia. But I think particularly in those who have significant symptoms, if they are improved with HRT, there's, there's a lot that to suggest that there's probably going to be a net benefit, but it's going to, going to be individual to the to the to the person i just want to point out once again how nice it is to speak with a person who is a physician and a researcher right, <laughs> right? it's <laughs> nice this i can see you just slip so effortlessly between these <laughs> these positions i want to uh just pause for a second because sometimes i feel like we're always playing defense around cognitive decline loss of aging you know this 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 sort of scarcity mindset and almost like uh, doomsday prepping for, for the, the, the day that are coming. And I still feel at, you know, I've just turned 50. Um, I still feel like I'm actually, the, the blade is quite sharp and I'm really interested in like still learning new skills and sort of shredding. Um, and I feel like I still have a window for that. And I have friends who are 10 years older than me who are just killing it still, mm -hmm. at least. Um, one of the things that I think is I really do like is that you're not only just in this research hospital, you're not just teaching and working with sort of people who have been injured or have disease states. You're also on the other side of the fence, sort of looking forward, sort of almost taking those lessons. And you have described some of your work with Formula One racing. Can you talk a little bit about that and sort of what has surprised you in those fields and maybe even how, if we have time, how that has influenced the way, the work that you're doing on the other side. My role uh, in Formula One, so I work with a, a company called Hinsa Performance that provides the coaches to some number of, of uh, drivers on the grid, depending on the year, it's maybe, it's been like eight to 12 or something over the years that I've worked with them, the last five or six years. And they also provide some medical services, some physio services to uh, like the uh, engineers and mechanics who are obviously, you know, working hard, you know, just as hard as the, the drivers are. And my job is quote unquote as a performance consultant. So I'm usually working with the coach and sometimes also with the driver on essentially whatever I can, whatever I can do to help support what they need. So sometimes it's nutrition stuff, sometimes it's sleep stuff. Um, sometimes it's performance related stuff. It's basically, if you wanted like a bargain basement, Peter Tia, Andrew Huberman, Matthew Walker, and Andy Galpin all at the same time, that's essentially what I'm trying to do. Um, <laughs> you did describe range earlier as an important, uh, yeah. David Epstein, we hear you. So like, so like not as good as any of those individually, but maybe enough in each bucket to kind of, <laughs> to kind of give, give a, give a bit of everything. Um, and a lot of it ends up being um like bs filtering so imagine mm. you are literally the best driver in the world and that you know the formula one drivers i think it's it's wouldn't take too much to say that these are some of the best if not the best drivers in the world so the best of what they do and at any given time you have hundreds of people who want you to do this thing take this test take the supplement use this device um and at the same time these coaches are deeply uh, ensconced in the science, right? They all have graduate degrees in something related to, to exercise and performance, and they're trying to stay on top of their game. So often the conversation is, is this a thing that I should be thinking about? Um, or if not, what's something else that I should be thinking about to solve this particular problem? Um, when I first went in to, to Formula One, I was like, I'm going to show up on day one. I'm going to have a hundred things that are going to be amazing and they're going to change everything. And then you realize that <laughs> <laughs> these drivers maybe have time for one thing, maybe, mm. if you really make a good case for it. So the, the thing that I learned, right, because they are traveling to a new time zone every week. They have massive uh, media commitments. They also, you know, occasionally they want to take a vacation. And um, then there's the huge amount of time they spend working with the engineers on the car, actually driving the car, 
working in the simulator, all this kind of stuff, as well as their um, actual like physical training. So it's really, I've really had to learn, like, what's the one thing, like, figure out what the, what's the one thing that I would do in this scenario, rather than show up with a laundry list of 100 things, which is what we kind of tend to do in this sphere, right? Here's my list of 47 biohacks to increase your deep sleep by 10%, right? <laughs> Don't have time for that. What's the one thing? Uh, and is deep sleep even the thing that we should be worrying about? So that's that's kind of where I've had to end up. And it's been very humbling, actually, because you really have to think about, I'm going to go into this conversation, and I've got a chance to suggest one thing, uh, like what's it going to be? And you know, how am I... Am I sure that this is the thing that we should be focusing on right now? I, I have just to jump in and say I I so appreciate that that perspective, and I think your uh, compatriot uh, and Dr. Andy Galpin calls those a performance anchors. Can you can you untether that anchor that's that's keeping you back? And, and it really does helpful. Sometimes you can you can walk in. Just I understand the sort of scale and scope of what you're saying, but also you can walk in and say. Uh, Hey, have you, have you just tried, you know, pushing your foot on the gas pedal a little harder? I mean, sometimes it is that obvious. Uh, I, I will. So um, I, I can give I can give an example. Um, yes, please. So uh, one uh, one driver that I worked with um, once sent me a whole bunch of Aura data, and they were concerned about their REM sleep in particular because their REM sleep was was low on the Aura ring. And I looked at like several days of this, and you know. Immediately, you're kind of thinking like, what are the hacks? What are the specific things I can do to try and upregulate REM sleep? And what you realize well, if you look after several days is that he's only spending five hours in bed every night. And when you only have five <laughs> hours of sleep opportunity, you're going to have less REM sleep because REM sleep happens at the end of sleep. Like you get, That's where the majority of it occurs. So that the hack is spend more time in bed. So even at the point even at the pointiest <laughs> tip of the pointiest sphere of performance like the basics still matter yeah you know i i we love hearing that because you know we put we published this book this last year called built to move and i think there was in some circles sort of this perception it was like okay well these are for people who've never done anything physical and we were like no 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 the amount of elite athletes we've worked with who have gotten sucked down the rabbit don't, hole. Don't eat fiber. Yeah. And, and they're, they're doing all these bells and whistles and using all these devices and doing all this high tech stuff. And then when we really push comes a shove, learn they haven't eaten a vegetable in the last week, you know, and we're like, actually the basics still matter for everybody. You know, you can add on all these other things if you have time, yeah. but we still see so many people, including all these elite athletes really are missing the basics often. And I, I I just want to double click on something that I think is is really insightful is that you take all of this sort of capacity, knowledge, ability to problem solve, uh, see the data, you know, aggregate info, and really it comes down to behavior change mm -hmm. where you're really looking at what is it that this person is going to do or will do or agrees to do that we both agree, which is expert, right? clinicianship, expert physicianship, right? Yeah. That you person comes and sees you and you're like, here are the hundred things that could change your life. And here are the three things that we agree together that we'll, we'll attack. I'm working, I get to work with some college students and, you know, being able to come in and sort of see this landscape. And I'm like, oh, well, you didn't eat breakfast for the last five hours, you know, and you did three hours of training and you haven't, you're in a fat, like, it's so amazing yeah, to like, see. What this, are we even talking like, about? <laughs> I think the technical term is type one error almost, right? <laughs> is that, uh, you know, just like, it's so easy to leap ahead for a technical solution to a behavioral problem. Yeah. I think the, the, the big white whale, golden egg, whatever in health and performance is, creating and supporting behavior change at scale and that that matters for individual performance right you know maybe if you're a, an elite level athlete you can pay several coaches to to help you with behavior change but if we're thinking about population um population health helping people do this stuff I, is 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 the most important thing right there's enough knowledge out there right People know they need to sleep more and drink less and maybe eat a vegetable occasionally. But sometimes that's really hard to do. So supporting behavior change, like behavior change is, is the thing. Like, And it's however you can get people to do that, uh, that's, the, that's the most important thing.
So I've got a couple more questions before we let you go. Um, I know you touched on it a little bit when you were talking about blood panels and you have sort of addressed some supplements, but I would love to just um, see if we can pass on a little bit of useful advice on supplementation as it relates to brain health to our listeners. And I I do want to say that I know that it really depends on your blood work and that certain people that it is probably pretty individual based on what your blood results say. But are there any supplements that you think for brain health, everybody should be taking regardless of what their blood panel says, like, you know, you aren't, you don't have, and aren't going to get a blood panel anytime soon, but you should probably be taking X, Y, or Z. Um, or a resource even that allows them to learn a little more about mm. it. So I think covering your basics, nutrition, so say if, if, if you, if you, if you don't have a blood panel, you're not going to get one anytime soon. Like I'm probably not going to recommend that you take a bunch of vitamin D because that's something that you need to keep an eye on. But you probably should spend more time in sunlight uh, if you if you possibly can. Right, I'm in Seattle, so I only get that half the year. Um, but then omega th- omega threes and B vitamins uh, are critically important, and it's pretty difficult to get that wrong. Um, so if you don't eat fish regularly, take a high quality fish oil supplement, you know, two to three grams per day. Um, take, I would, I would take probably, you know, a B vitamin complex. You just make sure you're covering at least your recommended daily amount of B12, B6, uh, folate, uh, B2, which is riboflavin. That's probably worth doing if, if you're not going to test anytime soon, ideally you would test those levels, test your homocysteine, which is probably, a uh, one of the most important risk factors to track. Um, I think everybody with a brain should take creatine. Um, it's basically like magic um, for the brain as well as well as the body. Uh, particularly as you get older, lots of evidence to support uh, the benefits of creatine on cognitive function, um, as well as is p- going to be protective or at least provide some mitigation potentially if you have some kind of. Ac- uh, cerebral accident so be that be that traumatic or a stroke um so that's something that i would recommend to most people um choline maybe another one again has been shown to improve cognitive function as people get get older you can get it from lesser thin you can get it from eggs uh if you don't like those things then uh, a supplement is maybe worth considering um and then final thing i would eat a lot of berries uh anthocyanins from berries um do a whole bunch of uh, great things, both for the gut health, vascular health, as well as brain health. Um, and so if you don't eat berries regularly, then you know blueberry anthocyanins, I think, are worth considering. But certainly none of that's essential, except for maybe I would always, almost always recommend creatine. Um, but if you're not covering those basics in a varied diet, you know, getting lots of B vitamins and omega-3s and choline and things from your diet, um, then you know supplementation is certainly worth considering. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you. So what are you looking forward to just research wise or as an what individual, are what are you working on? Like what's next? What's next for you, doctor? Um, there's, uh, I guess a, a few things depending on the sphere. So we, we have a lot of, um, uh, uh, research currently funded in, in the lab to try and figure out optimal combinations of, of treatments for, for newborn brain injury. That's still like a large part of my, large part of my research. So I'm really excited to do that because we're kind of seeing more and more that it's, you know, for any, and it's the same for any uh, brain injury, uh, regardless of, of where you are in life and how that injury occurs. There's probably not like one therapy that's ever going to be magic, right? It's going to be some combination of, of therapies and interventions over time. So trying to figure out some of that out is something that we're working on. And then in the human health and performance world, uh, Andy Galpin and I and, and a few others have, have put together this um, like blood biomarker signature based on very simple blood tests of muscle health and function. And we're in the process of sort of validating that and creating a calculator that people can use and, and showing that it predicts things like mortality risk and uh, dementia risk and cognitive function. Um, I think that's going to be pretty cool. And it's going to be something for, for people to to both play with as well as being you know potentially important um, clinically. Uh, you know, things you can track over time that are then uh, easily predictive of, of long-term brain health and performance. So that, so on two different scales, like humans and basic science work, those, those are some of the things that I'm excited about. Awesome. Where can people follow your work and find you in the internet sphere and social media? Um, Instagram is is a pretty good 
place. I usually put up uh, clips of podcasts and things like that. And if I publish a new paper that that I think people will be interested in, uh, I'll put it up. So at Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. And then I have a website where a lot of that kind of stuff feeds to as well, which is uh, drtommywood.com. Awesome. Well, Kelly and I are going to be going downstairs and doing some bicep curls Fantastic. immediately. No, so no, no. thank you so much brain for being curls. here. Brain curls. Brain <laughs> curls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have an incredible strength coach up there uh, for the university, uh, Ron Kefri. So I need to come up and see you all. Yeah. Go and visit my family. You uh, absolutely should. We uh, Huskies are having a good year. Come watch some football or you know, maybe if it's Facts. later. Yeah. We're excited to see that play out. Hey, thank you so hey, much. Thanks again, Dr. Wood. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it. Stop.